Chapter 3. We squashed ourselves into a dark doorway. Z said, It's okay, I think. You think? I'm not known in these parts. Helpers aren't liked. I looked around. There were some intact-looking women subs standing about. It began to impress itself upon me how it might be to live there, existing in a chaotic world inhabited by crazed and diseased people. For the first time, I also began to appreciate my good health. Come on, she said at last. Weaving our way through the dirty streets, she led me hand in hand. The touch of her soft skin eased me. Listening intently, I heard strange sounds emanating from the dark dwellings. In the narrow roads, ghost-like faces loomed from the shadows, fingerless hands reaching out. At times, I swore I could feel the brush of wound-encrusted bodies. All the time I turned my head, Z spurred me on. She was healthy, a young woman who could easily have fallen victim to the grasping bodies. But she seemed to know the place back to front. Not far, she said, panting. Gasping also, I looked into her eyes. Around us, fires burnt everywhere. It is hell, she stated. You know this part, I said stupidly. Yes, she smiled, I know it, the whole town. Played here as a kid, played amongst the rats and the crazy ones. Ran away from the old men who tried to catch us. Ran away from the body snatchers. Nothing changes in this damn place but the eyes and the bodies. The what? You said the body snatchers? Come on, she said, don't fake it. You work for the government, you must know all about it. About what? I asked open mouthed. It was one thing to hear the talk of the people, another to hear reality. She looked at me with a typically quizzically strained face, her intelligent eyes. About what? I urged. Not now, she said. If you truly don't know, you'll find out well enough. A figure stumbled up to us. Alpi, it said. Be kind with your muffer, an alpi. C shooed the woman away. The old lady put out her arms to feel for the brick of the wall, but they crumpled and she banged her head. I flinched. She doesn't feel anything, was Z's curt response. Them will get you, the old woman sang. Them will get you. Have your limbs off, she grinned. Her mouth was dark and toothless. She cackled and dropped to her knees, rolled over into the gutter. Can we help her, I asked. Z looked at me with contempt. Rain began to fall. The guttering from the buildings shot spouts of water onto the streets. The fires and the braziers were dampened. Nearly there, said Z. Where you live? If you like, she smiled. Disappearing down a greasy walled alleyway, she pulled me in quickly. I don't want anyone to know what's happening, she explained. Only those that need to know. We entered a broken down gate and a cat screeched from somewhere in the black backyard. Z hissed. The rain falling and mixing with a sulphurous smoke caused the air to feel acrid and acidic. Before the back door of the house, she glanced at me. I appreciate everything, she said quickly. I nodded, unsure how to respond. I haven't done anything. But you will, she almost beseeched. I'll do what I can. And in an instant, the former hierarchy was re-established. Knocking on the door in a particular pattern ensured a light flickered from an upstairs window. I kept glancing into the shadows of the courtyard, expecting to see deformed figures lurking or the scuttling of rats. It was only later that I was told how the rats would eat to death the bodies who didn't, or rather couldn't, make it to the dying fields close to the mass graves. But people there tolerated the rats. I was unsure if this was for sound or superstitious reasons, or did they eat spiders? The door opened as rain began to lash down. A face, a friendly face, took shape behind candlelight. It's you, the face beamed. Aye, Z replied. And this is he, the face said, staring at me. It is. Welcome, come in. We don't lack manners in Sue. This was the colloquial way they referred to Subberth. Quick, before the rain gets you. Inside, I was cheered by the relative tidiness, but a noise from upstairs distressed me. Pay no attention, she advised. This is my mother, motioning to the lady who had let us in. Don't worry, you can see she's disease-free, alive. Most of us are in these abouts. Limply, I held out my hand. Pleased, I said. Z stared at me intently. I'd expected the mother to be horribly disfigured, if alive at all. Pleased, said the mother. 
Greetings and welcome to Sue. To her daughter, she said, I'll get these a drink. To me, she said, you'll all want a drink. Yes, said Z for me. This is where I am from. Now you see. Not too bad, eh? Not quite upper. Then again, we're alive and well, at least. Me being a helper, that's enough for the folks. Mr. Adam, she added. There's no point, I said. Just Adam, just call me Adam. I've seen too much for... Again, she threw me an acute look. You seem to know so little for a government worker. She was right. I, but you must have seen all the flick-ups, the expression used by the sub for flicks. Must have learnt all the disease stuff at school and college. Must have friends who go to the white bodying. Her questions came relentlessly. Must have friends with perfect little babies, eh? She was a helper and talking to me this way. But in my arrogance, I had not even carried a weapon into the sub town. I've seen things, I half explained, and I had. Things seen and thoughts buried in my life in Upper. But she laughed. I've come to help. I don't need to do this. You can't assume anything from me. But the words I spoke rang false. I do thank you, she said suddenly, very earnestly. Believe me, I'm yours, she added. Her mother came in with the drinks. The mother stared intently at me. Later, when she left, so Z and I could talk, I asked Z why she had scrutinised me so. Because you're so perfect, was Z's response. And I wanted to say something about her form, the beautiful daughter. But I laughed. Tell me about the disease, I said. Tell me the truth. An upper who wants to know the truth, she asked incredulously. Yes. I also wanted to ask her about my secret colleague, the sender of the e-message, and about their relationship. But I knew I could not. I wanted to ask her for many reasons. And as yet, I had not even seen the child I was to resurrect. The disease, she mumbled. Yes. What do you know, she asked. That it's incurable, that the body goes numb, the brain too. That's it, that's all. We know how bad it is, we think we know. I know that illegal fighting goes on with subs. Every so often we get documentary flicks on the portable and then the government overrides the channels. I watched her reaction. You haven't got much time for uppers, have you? She smiled. How can you say that? I clean for uppers. I wash the laundry of uppers. I get down on my hands and knees for uppers. There was a twinkle in her eye. I'm risking everything so my child can be brought up as an upper. And guess what? I even slept with one. That's how children get to be. Or is it different in your world? Our world? No, no, it isn't different. You know how scarce children are becoming. And I thought of the white rooms. Why do we send the children there? Couldn't there be healthy children amongst those sent? There had to be. Z had a healthy child. At least I suppose so. I'll tell you my uncle's story, if you like. I nodded. We've been lucky as a family. Oh mother, oh father, dear departed, let the moon show his evil face. This was a saying to prevent bad luck. But ten years ago, when I was a little girl, my uncle began to notice the numbness. Gradually he began to lose the feeling in his toes and feet. At that time we prayed it was leprosy. Can you imagine? I presume you have shots against leprosy too. Yes, she carried on, but the numbness spread and he damaged his cold foot. At the same time, he began to forget things, only occasionally, you know, not too dramatic, but the numbness crept up his other leg, and before long, he was walking like a man with clumsy, Sioux-made, artificial limbs. In this world, my uncle had made a living as an autoscribe, a job which was part secretarial and part copywriter. We try and keep things going, you know, but he lost it just as anyone with the disease loses it. So it's the beginning of what we call the oubliette. I frowned. The start of a prison within a prison. My uncle had to move out of this end of town into the shanty. That's where we came in. That's how I know it so well. My mother never lost touch with him. No huts, no rats for him. She did her best. And I would do things too. That's when I learned how to get my hands dirty. You have to live with the disease to truly appreciate its horror. Simple things like the way he would sit down and then mess himself without knowing, and how the brain would lose pathways to sense, how he would rub his hands together to keep the feeling, call me by his wife's name, descend into the filth and poverty of the shanty, how sores and cuts would gape dryly upon his body, how he began to putrefy, how his brain, his own brain, scared the hell out of him, and how in the end he couldn't do anything but take shallow breaths and stare at the ceiling, you know? How his body froze from the outside, then gradually froze in the inside, and all the while he was losing his precious marbles, and the smell of the dry wounds, 
the maggots and rats nibbling the body. But they didn't eat him alive. Oh mother, oh father, they departed, let the moon show his evil face. And nobody giving a shell, a derogatory term, arrived at from the shell-like motive on the old upper currency. It was true that we knew the mechanisms of the disease, but not the reality. Not most of us, or we knew partial things. There were things Z was unaware of. She did not know the function of the white rooms. I was sure she had never seen any white bodying, though I never asked her. It was a different world, sub -earth, to an upper. But we didn't question that reality. The subs lived in disease. We could not risk integrating them, and they had been our enemies in the past. We allowed them to come as helpers. Wasn't that something? We hadn't necessarily to take the risk, and they had to remember that it was upper scientists that had invented the shot. We didn't exclude subs from buying shots. There were subs I had on record who had bought the serum, but I couldn't say these things to her. We even suppressed many diseases with vaccinations in the food we sold them. They laid all the blame on us, but it wasn't the whole story. The mother came back into the room. She came as silence took over, except for the drumming of the rain, and I wondered if she had been listening to our conversation. The room we were in was small and cluttered, but the mother and daughter moved with greater freedom than I or my wife did in our own home. The fate of Z's father was never mentioned. The mother smiled at me and turned to Z and nodded. It's time, the girl said. I looked at them both. Z leant forward and placed a hand on my leg. A shudder spiralled down my spine. I felt enclosed, cocooned and yet imprisoned at the same time. In a strange way, I was also in the oubliette. I followed them through to a hallway. Only the candle the mother carried and a candle in the hallway gave light. The smell of the wax was rich. Stairs were revealed when heavy curtains were parted. We climbed. At the top of the stairs was a small landing with three doors leading off. The candlelight was caught by a draught and shifted the shadows. The bizarre situation I had contrived to get myself in was almost humorous, I thought, flippantly, except that what I was proposing to do was highly illegal, deadly serious. We looked into the room. The mother lifted the candle high. I saw the child asleep. He was beautiful, as his mother. Seeing him there made the danger concrete. I was in charge of records for my region. If I had caught an upper doing what I was doing, it would have meant a permanent stay in suburb, without shots. Z and one of my colleagues had transgressed the laws. It was these laws I had stood resolutely by since becoming a man. You couldn't count share shuffling. One of my colleagues had effectively put our world at risk. If the disease mutated through an offspring, then... Shot or no shot, we could all have ended as subs. But this man did it for Z, for lust. And even as I think now, I remember how she looked then, and I wanted her too. But all of those thoughts on my first visit to sub -earth are long gone. Staring at the child reinforced my fear for my as yet unborn baby. Of course I would help them. They knew that I wouldn't be able to dissociate this innocence and beauty with the child growing in my wife's womb. Besides, they also knew that exposing relations between a work colleague, one I had chosen, and one of my helpers would not be a good career move. Already it was too late. I was trapped. Trapped in a cell without windows. Upwards, through a mystical shaft, lay salvation. The child slept as I thought. You see, Z said to me, standing close by. I nodded. You'll take him? asked the mother. I peered down into his cot. He was about six months old. It could be arranged. I had the ability to transfer papers. Many children were stillborn in our world. There mightn't even be the need for the orphanage, where only the mentally handicapped babies remained, nicknamed subs, not sent to the white rooms. And who knows, a thought with new cynicism, perhaps kept for transplants too. There would be people willing to take him on as their own. I could do that anonymously, I considered. Then I checked myself. What was I getting out of all this? Will you do it? Z asked. Did she read my mind? Did she notice the changing expressions on my face? The mother left the room, and with us and the child in darkness, Z came to me, and lifting herself, kissed the side of my mouth. Was this my reward? I thought of my wife and the child growing in her, and I smelt the scent of the beautiful young woman. Another reckless act offered itself up to me. I couldn't resist embracing her. But you have to know, I didn't break the rules. Not the government record rules, anyway. With my eyes staring at the ceiling, my body felt lifeless. Her smooth and naked body lay next to mine, one of her hands resting awkwardly on my side. I hadn't broken the rules, quite, 
but I felt like a dog. I would have to tell my wife I'd worked even longer hours at the office. Thank God for the secrecy. Thank God for the record and registry office. A snuffle sound escaped from the baby. The room was pitch black. With all my soul, I wanted to do the ancient thing with her. Rain splashed against the hidden window pane. Before light, we would have to begin the journey back. I would become a father before my time. In her sleep, she was restless, foreshadowing the action of my wife, Jo. C forced me to hunt for spiders before she would finally sleep. Perhaps that was the final bizarre act. As a helper, she should have been able to sniff the things out of dark corners. But her fear of spiders was real enough. For all I knew, and was insanely dismissive of, there might have been a spider crawling up to the waste pipes at that very moment. But I'm jumping the gun of my story. Later, I was to be infected. Back then, I was clean. And regular shots, usually, kept me that way. And kept me a chasm's distance from all the subs. Even the beautiful sub that lay next to me in the bed.